All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, we're here tonight for our Eur Eurasian Dove webinar, a year-round hunting opportunity. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, we still have uh, some people probably be coming in, but we're about the halfway mark. So thanks for coming. Uh, once again, if you're just entering, please use the question and answer function in order to ask some questions. Our staff that are behind the scenes will try to answer them or we'll have them answered live. So stand by with that and uh, we'll, we'll have this webinar going in a second. So first off, I'd like to go ahead and start with the poll. And uh, our participants and our panel can answer this poll. And I'm gonna read along because this doesn't display in the recording, so uh, just bear with me. But go ahead and at your own rate if you want, and we'll get going. So first I'm gonna ask your experience. So here's the first, and somebody's texting me and I better make sure what it is. Uh, saying chat is disabled. Let me see if I can enable that. Wasn't supposed to be. All right. Sorry about that. Well, use the question and answer. You can put some comments in there. So here's the questions. Uh, we're asking your experience. Have you ever taken a Eurasian collared dove? Uh, yes or no. Number two is, have you ever hunted exclusively for Eurasian collared dove? Meaning that was your target species. You went out exclusively for them. Want to know how many have done that? Number three, have you ever eaten a Eurasian collared dove? And number four is, why are you most interested in hunting the Eurasian collared dove? So I'm gonna give you about three more seconds to answer. A lot of you are finishing up. Uh, three, two, one, in the poll. And I'm going to share the results. So pretty uh, good mix here. Uh, for the question, have you ever taken Eurasian collared dove? 52% said they have. So almost 50-50 uh, on participation. Have you ever hunted exclusively for Eurasian collared dove? And only 17% said yes, um, they've gone out exclusively for those. Okay, that's kind of what's expected. A lot of people take Eurasian collared dove incidental to uh, nor normal dove hunting. Have you ever eaten a Eurasian collared dove? Um, 52% said yes, that's great. Um, good to see that. And why are you most interested in hunting the Eurasian collared dove? And 71% said to be able to spend more hunting days in the field. 26% said to get more wild organic meat. And 2% said it is their easiest option for hunting. All right, next poll. And no more jokes this week, uh, no jokes this time around. What we have is a new uh, section called Cliff Notes. If you're my age or older, you would know Cheers and old Cliffy Clavin, who always had some trivia for everybody. Also, Cliff Notes is something you use to uh, maybe cheat through a book. So get all that information. All right, so here's the launch. It is, what is the term for a group of doves? Choose all possible. Okay, so multiple choice. So choose that. There's bevy, coat, flight, or dual. Question number two. Eurasian dove young are known to fly over 300 miles from their birthplace. True or false? Number three. Doves, like most birds, have to scoop water, then lift and tilt their head to take in water. True or false? And number four is, although most doves and pigeons have a relatively short lifespan, three-year average, the longest recorded in Eurasian collared dove in the wild lived to be six to 10 years old, 11 to 14, or 15 to 18. Okay, a lot of participation. You guys are kicking in your answers there. I'll give it three, two, one, and the poll share the results. All right, so for question number one, everybody chose flight, that sounds really good, but it's actually all four of those, okay? You can have a bevy of dove, a coat of dove, a flight of dove, and a dual or dull of dove, okay? Eurasian dove young are known to fly over 300 miles from their birthplace. 
place. And that is true. Uh, this study was done in, um, in Europe and they found that these dove were migrating uh, north and west, which kind of explains their whole uh, migration and um, how they've been able to take over different areas. When you think about where they started and, and Catherine Miller, who's joining us tonight, will be able to expand on this. Um, they started down in Bahamas and they've been working their way west and north across the United States. So we'll see that a little bit later. Yep, so that was true. And then doves, like most birds, have to scoop water, then lift and tilt their head to take in water. That is false. They can actually dip their beak into the water and suck in water just like it's a straw. So a little bit different. All doves and pigeons can do that. Uh, pretty interesting. And usually, I guess from what I, I read, they also can get pretty much their daily uh, need of water in that one drinking. And then although most doves and pigeons have relatively short lifespan, uh, three-year average, the longest recorded Eurasian collared dove in the wild lived to be, it was actually 13 years and eight months. So the 11 to 14, but they did have a captive uh, dove that lived to be over 17 years of age. So um, kind of the older ones the, down at the bottom, but from most on part average, it's a three year, three year lifespan. All right, thank you for participating in that. We're gonna go ahead and keep going on the slides here. So things we're gonna learn tonight, we're gonna learn where these doves, doves came from. Um, Catherine Miller, who's, she's one of our biologists, environmental scientists with our department. Uh, she was here helping me out with the quail and dove webinar in December. And um, she did a really good job. So I asked her back for this. They want chat on. I don't know how to turn the chat on. Sorry. I'll try to work on that a little bit later. Sorry, I can't get the chat on. Um, use the question and answer, please. Um, uh, we are also going to learn how to how they became so prolific. You know what happened. I mean, when I started as a game warden, I had never seen one of these before, and now it's the bird I probably see most often. Um, how do we identify them versus another dove? Uh, fairly important. Um, most the biggest part is we need to know what a morning dove looks like so that we don't take those out of season, but. Uh, being able to distinguish between a Eurasian dove and a morning dove will be important. And um, where and how do we hunt for them? And are they worth eating? So we're gonna be talking about those things and I, I can see why I need to chat on uh, for your comments, but uh, I'll try to get that going. I don't know why it's not. All right, next slide. So here's Catherine Miller. She's been with our department for six years now. She's originally from Arizona. And she became hooked on birds in the outdoors through numerous volunteer opportunities, and band, which was banding, camping with the folks. She got her bachelor's degree in Southern California and moved to Texas where she got her master's of science and her PhD. So she's working on grassland birds and in, including quail. And outside work, she enjoys birding, hanging out with the dog and family and doing a variety of crafts. So thank you for coming on, Catherine. I'm gonna turn over the program to you. So if you wanna start your share, uh, I'll see if I can get the chat working for everyone. Okay, great. Can everybody see my slide? Uh, yeah, it's perfect. Okay, great. Um, so thank you for the introduction. Um, We're going to go ahead and just jump in. Um, and if at any point you um, have questions, like uh, uh, Sean said, put them into the Q&A and uh, I'll be available at the end to answer any questions. I always like to start these talks with a little bit of classification. Um, so if you think back to high school and the basic things that you learned about the kingdom, the five of the class, the order, so forth. Uh, so we're talking about uh, dove species tonight. That's phylum chordata, class aves, order columbiformes, and family columbidae. In 
Columbiformes, that order, there's only the one family, Columbidae. So that covers all of the different dove and pigeon species that we have. It's a fairly diverse family because of that. And it has spread across six continents. The word dove, we think, comes from an old Germanic word or old Norse word um, that has to do with uh, their diving flight that they make. Dove are anisodactyl, that's three toes in front, one in the back, the one in the back is the thumb to us. Uh, they have short legs, they're sometimes described as having weak legs. Uh, all doves have relatively small heads compared to the rest of their big body. And they all tend to be very good flyers muscles in the chest and good strong wings. And that's gonna be important when we talk about disbursement for these birds. I also like to talk very quickly about uh, phylogeny. So how we think these different groups of birds evolved through a timeline. So we know that there was an early ancestor. The first to break off were the Zeneta that would be Zeneta macrora, the morning dove, and Asiatica, the white-winged dove, these two that we have here in California that are native dove species. The next to break off would have been the bantel pigeon. And then several non-native species that we do have here in California, spotted dove and rock pigeon. And then finally, an ancestor that split to the African collar dove and the Eurasian collar dove. And this is an important distinction because all of the evidence that we have right now seems to suggest that the ringneck dove or ringneck turtle dove or Barbary dove, um, those are some different common names you hear for a particular type of dove, are all domestic versions of the African collar dove. So when we talk about ringneck dove, when we talk about Eurasian collar dove, they're not exactly the same thing. Um, and it becomes an important distinction when we talk about hunt season as well. So with that in mind, how do you tell Eurasian collar dove and African collar dove apart? So the first thing you wanna look at is the vent or the undertail coverts. In Eurasian collar dove, they're gonna be gray. In African collar dove, they'll be more white. You wanna look at the upper outer underside of the tail feathers. That sounds like a contradiction, it's not. So if you look over here at this diagram, this is the underside of the bird. This is the vent, the coverts. These are the tail feathers. This is the outer tail feather. You wanna look at the upper part of the outer tail feather and see how far down that black extends down the tail feather. And then you also wanna listen for the call. The call is different. Uh, for Eurasian collar dove, it's a three note call, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And of course, these birds can breed together and make hybrids, in which case those traits tend to be a, a hybrid of the two species, which can make things a little bit more confusing. So as Sean mentioned, one of the biggest questions we get is how did these birds get here to the US and California and become so prolific? So we're gonna start with the how first. Uh, so far as we know, they're native to India and maybe to Sri Lanka, this little island off of India. But when we started really starting, starting to document birds, bird movements, starting to put bands on birds, uh, starting to tie strings on birds, that was the early form of a band. Um, not the greatest way to do it, but at that time, that's what we were doing. Um, to track movement, Already at that point, you're starting to see the industrial revolution, you're seeing advancement in the medical sciences, so you have more people living longer. So already in the 1800s, you're starting to see an impact of global warming. And with that global warming, birds move. So by the 19th century, as it creates a warm temperate climate, they moved up into China, Afghanistan and Pakistan, Pakistan and over as far as Turkey. By 1838, they were in Bulgaria and 1900, they were in the Balkans. 1945, they were throughout most of Western Europe. By 1953, they had reached the United Kingdom. By 1959, they had reached Ireland, Norway, Sweden, and were coming up the edge of uh, into Russia. By 1970, they reached into the Faroes, which are these islands north of uh, 
of Great Britain, and they'd also reached into Portugal. Catherine, really quick, there's a good question that came in uh, regarding the African collar doves. So are those present in California or is that just the, um, the turtle doves? Or the... the domesticated form of the African collar dove is present mm -hmm. as turtle dove. Mm -hmm. does, does that help to clarify it? Yeah, so it is an African collar dove, but it's a domesticated version of it, correct? Right. Correct. And in a moment, I'm going to put up a, another screen. We'll talk really briefly about where it's really challenging to understand where some of these birds come from when we start talking about captivity, too. Um, but that's a very good question and a good distinction. By the end of the 20th century, these birds had gotten up into the Ural Mountains, northern Africa, Canary Islands off the coast of Africa, and up into Iceland. So as I mentioned, it's a little challenging with dove because they do have those strong chest muscles and the ability to fly long distances, but they're also commonly kept in captivity, partly because they're so um, calm compared to other bird species. They tend to be a popular group of birds to rear in captivity. And because of that, it's kind of hard to know are birds in an area because they naturally got there or were they introduced or is it a, a situation where it's basically both? Um, and with California, we think it's probably a little bit of both actually um, for, uh, for, for some species. Mm -hmm. um, so we think that they could have been introduced to some of the areas of China that are more to the South. We think they probably were introduced to Japan and the Korean Peninsula Frankly, I think it could be either. I think they could have been introduced. I think some of them could have moved there on their own, both. They were introduced to the Bahamas. They didn't make this flight all on their own. They were introduced into the Bahamas. And so with that, we'll transition to North America. Bahamas are here. In 1975, a person who had them had a burglary. So some birds escaped and some birds may have been released at that point. Uh, that was approximately 50 birds that got out. And then Guadalupe is another island down here. In 1976, uh, there was a volcano um, that was threatening to erupt. So they evacuated the island. When they did that, they released all the birds that were in cages. And we think that the population in North America came from just those two incidents of birds getting out in the Bahamas and Guadalupe. So by Florida, uh, the birds were the birds were in Florida by the 1970s, into Oregon by 1999, Nevada by 2001. So it took a little while for them to spread across this, the continent, but they did get across the continent pretty much on their own. This wasn't very much due to introduction. This was just movement after they had been introduced to Bahamas. At this point, they're widespread across the US and New Mexico. So one of the ways that we track bird populations is the North American Breeding Bird Survey. And the advantage of this is that it was started in the 70s. So it goes quite a ways back and it is consistently captured throughout the US and up into Canada, to, uh, well, mostly to the US. Um, so all of these routes that you see here on this map, these are a random design where these routes have been laid out um, from a random point and in a random direction. And so people will go out, they'll count the route. And the nice thing about it is because it is a random design, we can take the information from this route, this route, this route, this route, this route, and we can make an estimate of what the number of birds would be on, on a route here that isn't actually being run. So we're basically, um, making some assumptions, making a model that makes assumptions about what the route would be based on routes around it. And for quail, it becomes incredibly important to do five-year rolling averages because quail are boom bust. Good year, they can do really well. They have large clutches. In a bad year, the population will probably not reproduce. It may bust. Dove are a little bit different, but we still do those five-year rolling averages because it smooths out the noise of those individual variations from year to year. 
Um, they aren't as dramatic with dove as they are with quail. Um, so if you listen to the quail talk, um, we did talk about that before. Mm -hmm. So these five-year rolling means, as an example, I create a mean from, uh, mean from 72 to 76 for the average for 1974. So our doves, just a really quick question, are doves affected by drought conditions for nesting as much, or is it just the retention part pretty much? Because being like a tree, um, maybe that's another reason for their success. They're able to nest in trees more so than some of the other birds. I think that's a really good question. Um, I think part of that, my answer, I might hold off until we get to the diet portion of the talk, but um, both uh, morning dove, white winged dove, and Eurasian collar dove, they can all nest in trees and typically do. Um, but certainly if you have a prolonged drought, it starts to affect the landscape and it will affect them. I think quail might be, I think it's safe to say quail might be a little bit more sensitive to just not breeding any year when it's really dry. Um, but it, it kind of depends on how long that drought has happened. So Eurasian collar doves in California were first documented in 2004. I used the surrounding states data as well for these models. And so I could look back and see for Arizona, the first documentation was 2003. So we think this imperial area, this is probably birds naturally moving in from, um, from Arizona across the Colorado River. Um, and then there's a little bit of a population here in the 2005 map for um, San kind of south of the Bay Area, San Francisco area. Um, we also know that there were birds being recorded in the San Luis Obispo area. So those are probably a combination of dispersers and potentially some people might have had them and they got out. Uh, so I think it's probably a little bit of both, but I think it's probably mostly natural movement of these birds when we talk about Eurasian collared dove, when we talk about ring neck dove, ring neck turtle dove, those are pretty much all birds that got out from, uh, from people that had them as captive doves. So we're able to take these maps and create rolling averages for any year that we want to. I tend to try to stick to the major years. So here you see 2005, 2010, by 2015, now you're starting to see some areas that are hot spots, but a lot more area across the state where you'll drive a route and you will see at least one Eurasian collar dove, if not more. And then 2019, this is the individual data from that year alone. And you can see that the species is pretty much spread throughout most of California, except for the Sierras and not so much into the Eastern edge, the um, Eastern slope but most of the state. So we can take this map then, and we can put random points on the map and extract the data for each of those years. And that lets me do a trend. So we can see here with 2005, when we first started doing the five-year rolling average and see that steady increase all the way up. Um, 2017 is the last year that I did the five-year rolling average for. So 18 and 19 is just the individual raw data for that one year. It kind of looks like it might be plateauing, but we would need more data from the next couple of years that are released um, to see if this is gonna keep going up. I think it probably will, um, but we would need that data to put into the model. And as they release the data, we will continue to make these models. The other important thing I'd like to note here is you look at these standard error bars for 2005, they're fairly narrow. As you get up to 2015, those error bars have now gotten a little bit larger. So you certainly have um, populations that don't do as well as the average, but then you have numbers that are higher than the average. And this is exactly the opposite of what we see when we look at the uh, breeding birth survey data for pheasant. For pheasant, we see a gradual decline and we see that those error bars contract, they get smaller as the bird, um, as the population declines. And that means you don't have those areas where you have populations that are doing well, that are robust, 
to counterbalance the ones that are declining as much. Um, you also see that with the northern bobwhite, which is a species that we don't have here unless somebody releases it. Now, when these, when at what time of year is this uh, survey done? Is it um, a set day? Is it the Christmas Day one, or is it some other one? Um, it happens over a wider window than the Christmas bird count. The bird count is only, well, 20 days, I think. Um, the breeding bird survey, <clears throat> can you can do it as early as um, May in the really hot desert areas, it tends to be done in June throughout most of say the Central Valley. So it kind of depends on where you are, um, but it's mostly a June count, summer count. Gotcha. So <clears throat> in terms of their habitat, in their native areas, we know they like semi-arid environment. It can have acacia. It can be more of a, more of a savanna type environment, um, but semi-arid lowland. We also know that they have been documented fairly high up into the Himalayas. So they certainly can go up in elevation. And we know that they like backyards, orchards, and, are, and parks and are very adaptable to humans. This is one that I actually encountered at the park in Arizona. So it's my own photo. So you asked about um, drought. I think drought plays an important role in two ways. Uh, the first is what is naturally out there on the landscape for them to eat in terms of wild food, acacia seeds, whatever. And then also how does drought affect the water and the water allotments to the agriculture industry? And I think those two together um, are important considerations when we talk about what that effect of drought is for Eurasian collared dove. You're going to see this list and think, gee, that sounds an awful lot like what dove eat, like morning dove eat, and that's true. So they'll eat millet, sunflower, milo, corn, peanuts, pecans, and then they'll get into the things that are a little bit more human, like crackers and bread, and they'll eat berries too. They've been documented eating algae, this is in Europe, algae, termites, flies, caterpillars, aphids, small mollusks, and there's at least one report of a bird pulling mammal flesh off of a carcass. So their diet is quite variable, um, but it's mostly primarily seeds. And we do have two studies that looked at stomach contents that can support that for Florida, small sample size, but overwhelmingly millet, sunflower, milo, the types of things you'd expect to see. And Romania, a much larger sample size, again, corn and sunflower, and then smaller percentages of other grains and fruit. Not surprisingly, gravel was found in the stomach. Um, they're not that different than other birds. They will take in grit um, to help with digestion. If you're out trying to hunt these birds, there are a number of different ways you can get more familiar with Eurasian collar dove um, and make sure that you're taking the right bird species at the right location um, at the right time. Uh, part of it is behavior and part of it is listening to their call. So they make a distinctive cuckoo call. Uh, so it's three notes. Um, the story is that Zeus created the bird's call because a maid complained. She felt jilted because she was only being paid 18 pieces per year. So deca octo, 18. And that's what they used for the species name. If you can listen to the call and hear deca octo, you have a better imagination than I do, uh, but that's the story behind it. Birds will start calling fairly young. Uh, you don't usually hear a difference in the call until they're about a year old. Uh, males and females both make the call. Males tend to use it more frequently. They'll be up at a high perch and they'll call frequently three to 12 times in succession. They're using it both for defense and also for attraction of, of the female. Name. The females tend to have a higher fainter call, but they will do it as well. And then they'll also, um, both give a nesting, sort of a nest call. Um, 
It's similar to the Ku call. Uh, it's lower and slower though. It's not given in a series by the male. And it's used in a couple different ways. It's used when the pair is looking for the nest sites. The male takes an active role in this. He helps to look for the nest site. The female is the one that does the building, but they'll cooperatively do this together. And they will, um, they will reproduce while they are looking for nest sites. So they, they multitask. Uh, I'm trying to find a polite way to say that. Um, they will also use it to call the mate to come and relieve them at the nest so that they can get off the nest and go forage. Um, they'll also make a hua call. Uh, both sexes will do this. Uh, they typically do it when they're alighting on a branch or landing on the ground. Um, the male likes to do it in display flight as well. And he'll also do it if he's chasing birds from the territory. So more than anything, it's a alert defensive type of call um, that can also be used in display. So it has a couple different functions. Eurasian collar doves are aggressive around the nests. They protect the nest from other birds, including other Eurasian collar doves. This can involve hitting other birds with their wings, pulling feathers, jumping on another bird's back. They can dive from the air and strike at a bird with their bill. All of these behaviors have been documented, um, but outside of the nesting season, the bird species tends to be fairly gregarious as doves often are. They roost communally, and especially in cooler months, it's important because that allows them to keep their body heat. When a pair forms, they tend to be monogamous for at least that season. They can be monogamous longer than that. It depends an awful lot on um, whether one bird dies for any reason. Uh, we'll talk about predation in a moment. Um, but for whatever reason, if one bird is separated from the other bird, that would probably be when they would start looking for a different name. They pair up after the male gives his advertisement call and display. And in the US, we start seeing broods somewhere between February and May, which is kind of a long window. But at least we know from that that nests can start as early as January. In a mild climate, nests can occur year round a bird could pull off three to six nests in a year. Apologize, let me go back really quickly. It is important to clarify that in the mild climate, morning doves can also uh, pull off multiple nests in a year. They tend to mostly just try to get that one successful nest off the ground. That's their focus. But in the mild climate, morning dove could also nest year round. <laughs> As far as the uh, nesting process goes, the males look for the material, look for the nest site, and the female is the one that builds the nest. The nest can be something that actually has some structure and substantial um, base to it. It can be in a potted plant, just depends on the birds. So not that different than morning doves where you have a, quite a bit of variation in how they nest. Clutch size is two eggs typically. Incubation is about 15 days. Both sexes will incubate the young. And then the nestling phase is about 18 days. So 18 days for them to get from this little poof to something that looks a little bit more like this. So they look a little freaky when they're a little bit older, but they're working on getting cute. The parents feed them through regurgitation. They feed them crop milk. This is common in multiple dove species. It's a substance that is high in protein and fat. It also has antioxidants, immunoglobulin A, antibodies, and bacteria. They'll start feeding the young seeds at 10 days. Then when they fledge around 20 days, that's when they'll start pecking for their own seeds. And they're independent at 37 days. In terms of how they move um, out from the areas that they're hatched, the dispersal, most of our studies are from the old world. Uh, you, there was a study in Europe where they banded 13 hatch year birds. So that's birds that were born in that year. They recovered 12 of the birds more than eight kilometers away. So that's a pretty good distance. Um, 
one of those birds was from Dublin. So you have an example of it hopping across the water to a different island. From banding data, which is tricky because it tends to have limited return, um, the, we know that out of a study that they did there, 488 birds were banded. Only 46 of the bands were recovered. Of those 46, 22 were recovered about eight kilometers or less from the banding site, and 24 were recovered about eight kilometers away, one in Belgium and one in Germany. So that's about, of the recoveries, that's about half and half that went longer distances and stayed fairly close to home. So um, we don't really have a lot of information on migration in terms of they go to an area, they breed, they go to another area in the wintertime, and then they that same movement back and forth and back and forth. Uh, but we do know that they certainly can and will disperse. I had to look up the eight kilometers for us, you know, regular people that don't use that's about five miles, so. <clears throat> Thank you. We, we get grilled in scientists that we have to use metric. Um, yeah. and it has its advantages, certainly, but I should have put miles in here, too. Sorry yeah, about that. No problem. I, just for the rest of us who use the standard system here in the United States, we're, it's five miles. <laughs> sure. Um, in terms of competition, and this is a very common question we get, um, in terms of competition with uh, morning doves and other species, what do we know? We don't know very much about that. We know a few things. We know that they will chase other birds away from the seed. So that can be an instance of direct competition for food sources. We know that they can and do take seeds that are larger than what morning dove would take. And we've, I, there are some studies that have indicated that when they're with rock pigeon, they take seeds that are smaller than what rock pigeon would take. So if they're picking a particular size of seed, then the concept of competitive exclusion may not apply to them. Competitive exclusion just means that if you have two species, both using the same niche, they eat the same thing at the same time of day in the same way, that one is gonna out, one population will outcompete the other population. And if these birds are able to take seeds that are a certain size, they may not be competing directly with morning dove or morning dove with them as much as we think. It's hard to know. We don't know enough about that. We do know that their nesting cycle may be much longer than morning doves and that they may have a propensity to re-nest more often. And these wheels are part of the, uh, birds of the world account. It used to be called the birds of North America. Uh, they have these for pretty much every species. And so here on the left is morning dove. You wanna look at the central line, here is the egg. We know that morning doves can start nesting in February, picks up in March, goes through August, tapers off in September. And because of that, then the, the young phase, the young when the young are dependent upon the adult would be from March, picks up in April and goes through to August, tapers off into October. For Eurasian collar dove here on the right, they have designed this circle so that eggs, the, the, net, the, the season where they're on nests with eggs really starts to pick up in March, goes through October, tapers off, but it still keeps going all the way through. Same thing then with the young. So they'll pick up in um, in March, but they could potentially nest throughout the year. And finally, in terms of effects, we know that Eurasian collar dove can carry Trichomonas scalinae and Newcastle's disease. Both of these are lethal and they are easily spread from bird to bird. So I'm gonna apologize for some not as pretty photos, some gross photos, but um, I think it's important for both um, the public and hunters to be aware of these things uh, when they're out hunting. So Trichomonas gallinae is the one that I referred to before. Um, we do know that bantail pigeons will get another one called Trichomonas stapleri. This is an older citation, but we know it occurs in at least somewhere between five and 10% of hunter harvested doves. Trichomoniasis is usually fatal. Uh, it shows as puffed up, it shows in living birds as puffed up or ruffled feathers, 
listlessness, difficulty swallowing, regurgitating, drooling. And for both living and dead birds, you can see lesions in the mouth around the eye and if you have a dead bird into the esophagus. There is no evidence of transmission to humans. That is an important um, thing to consider when you're looking at these birds. That said, um, we'll talk about reporting these and you always want to be cautious and uh, use a glove or put your hand in the bag and then um, do it kind of like you pick up doggy doo doo where you invert the bag. Um, so the other one that I want to talk about really quickly is Newcastle's disease. This is a virus. Uh, it affects rock pigeons and Eurasian collar doves. It can absolutely occur in our native dove population as well. Um, it shed in saliva and nasal secretions and in their feces. It manifests as weakness and paralysis and tremors. The birds will have green diarrhea. And like trichomoniasis, you'll see increased mortality at your site, whether it's your favorite hunting area or for us banders, when we're out banding the dove, where we band, we'll see increased mortality. That's a sign that something like this is, is going on. Um, in humans, it rarely transmits to them, but when it does, it manifests as flu, and it's really primarily in poultry farmers, people who spend a lot of time in very close um, proximity to birds that are spreading it rapidly. So if you're out hunting, you shoot a bird, and you think that bird might potentially have a disease, there is a way that you can report this. You can also do it, uh, report it if you are um, finding the bird in your backyard or on a walk as well. Um, so we have a mortality reporting page. You'll go to the website and then um, go to Conservation Laboratories Wildlife Health Lab. This used to be the Wildlife, uh, Invest the wildlife Investigations Lab, Wildlife Health Lab, Monitoring and then Mortality Report. And um, I've also given Sean the link if he wants to put it up in the um, chat box as well. It, it'll be in the link uh, page. I'll send out after this. Um. Okay. And um, you can also shoot uh, the lab an email too if, if this becomes hard for you to do for any reason. Um, in terms of the population then, if these birds can breed throughout the year, what what is the limiting factor to their population? Um, one thing is the fact that they only have two eggs. Two eggs is not a large clutch, but if they can renest that easily, that's clearly not a very big limiting factor. So the limiting factors will be the predators. So we know that accipiters, cooper's hawks, sharp shinned hawks, short tailed hawks have all been reported taking Eurasian collar dove. There is one instance of a uh, Eurasian collar dove remains found at the burrow of a burrowing owl. So um, even that as well, um, they'll probably take a very young bird, not a large one, but very young one they might take. Um, we know from the old world, from Europe uh, and Africa and Asia, that uh, corvids will take the eggs. So house crows, which are about the same size as our American crow, Indian rollers, which is kind of similar to a jay in some ways, they'll take the eggs, which stands to reason that probably the native jay species that we have here probably are predating on them to some degree. We just don't know what that percentage is. Feral cats will take uh, Eurasian collar dove. Uh, in Europe, uh, foxes and stoats, stoats are kind of like weasels. Um, they've been documented taking um, Eurasian collar dove as well. And then really the only other limiting factor is hunting. So for the native dove species, we have harvest and hunt effort estimates. Those come from a couple of places. When you do um, hunting for morning dove, you are asked to do your hip. Um, so when you do that, then they ask for more information later on about how many birds did you shoot. We do our own survey out of CDFW. And then um, we do banding in conjunction with the federal government um, that that data then feeds in together with all the other data for them to say, okay, for morning dove this year, we're gonna say it's gonna be the standard level. That means 15 birds in the back, right? So we have that information for morning dove, but there's less information on Eurasian collar dove. What we do know from when we started asking about them in our state survey in 2006, is that the bag limit, the, the number of birds bagged rather, went up 
fairly dramatically to 2010. The number of hunters went up gradually, but didn't go very high. It didn't increase nearly as, as much. And then in 2014, we did contract out a survey, but the numbers were um, way off of the, the typical um, range that we would expect. So we think it's possible the hunters may have conflated grish and collared dove with the native dove when they answered the survey. So I'm not putting those estimates in here. And then 2020, we recognized that 2020 was rough because we had COVID, everybody was working from home, people were telecommuting, people had lost jobs. We also know that properties closed because of fire concerns. And then we also know that the sales of ammunition and firearms went up. So we decided we're gonna go ahead and do a survey anyway and try to understand um, how those things might have balanced out. So for Eurasian colored dove, it dropped back down to about 80,000 birds bagged as our estimate. And that's kind of between our 2008 and 2010 estimates. The number of hunters was about the same as it was in 2010. So probably somewhere around like 10,000, maybe a little bit less. So this is the information that we do have on the number of birds that are taken and the number of hunters that are uh, reporting that they take grazing and collar dove. One of the biggest challenges for hunting Eurasian collared doves, and many folks are aware of this, is where they occur. They like urban areas, they like suburban areas. And that means the hunter who's out hunting has to abide by the local ordinance, which usually means they can't shoot a gun within city limits. So my best recommendation, and Sean's gonna give you some others as well, is to do your best to try for the edges of suburban habitat where you might be out of those um, city limits but you're kind of close to the edge, the birds will be using those areas. Even if they're at a higher number in the urban area, will, they will use the edge and you can um, shoot them in those areas. As far as management with the department goes, Eurasian, Cove, Eurasian colored dove are non-native. They are invasive depending on how you define that word. So if you wanna say that they're invasive in the sense that the population has spread rapidly, into an area that they're not native to, sure, they're invasive. If you want to include as part of that definition that they are harmful to the native species, we just don't have enough information to say to what degree. I think they probably do affect our native dove species. We just don't know in what way and how much. Other than allowing the maximum possible yield, in other words, per Eurasian collared dove, it's open season year round and there is no limit on the bag. Other than that, we do not really manage Eurasian collared dove. That isn't to say we don't have some management questions we have discussed within our own program. Uh, again, it goes right back to how they directly affect the native dove species and other wildlife species, and how might they indirectly affect a species that is already experiencing a population decline. So for morning dove, they are slightly trending down, just slightly. Uh, we've had discussions with the flyway. The flyway is allowing for hunting as they always have, but we are watching a slight declining trend. So for certain populations of morning dove that might be declining more than that, do Eurasian collar dove have more of an impact than they would on a robust population? So we've discussed these things. We're curious about that. And we are thinking about how we would go about looking at these questions. And then I just wanna transition very quickly into um, one uh, new, re relatively new regulation. Most of you are probably familiar with it already because you've probably already purchased um, your license and validation. This is not likely to have an effect on Eurasian collar doves, but it is important for you to know. And that's the nesting bird habitat incentive program. So I spoke about this in December as well. Um, in 2018, the assembly, first assembly bill was passed that allows for monetary incentives to farmers that leave a portion of their land fallow to provide nesting substrate. Now, of course, this is dependent upon uh, snowpack in the Sierra and rain and water allotments, which has been a challenge. Um, but the goal of it is primarily to benefit ringneck pheasant and resident waterfowl. Um, it has potential to benefit California and gambles quail as well in certain areas, depending on how we use it. Um, how we use the funds from the program. 
it was contingent upon a water bond passing. That one did not pass. So an AB, so they passed AB 614, which added an additional fee of $10 to the validation. That's both validations. So if you want to hunt waterfowl and you want to hunt upwind game birds, that's $10 additional fee on each of those validations. Um, and this took effect January 1st. We know that it hits the hunter's pocketbooks at a time when everything else is incredibly expensive. We are not insensitive to that. Um, we just ask that you give us patience as we figure out how we are going to um, evolve this program into something that will benefit the species that you like to hunt. With that, I'm only going to leave you with one last thing. I promised Sean I was going to put this in the PowerPoint and then I forgot. If you are shooting dove, if you're hunting dove in September and you shoot a banded dove, please, please, please report it to reportband.gov. You get to keep the band. And I promise you hunting is not gonna get taken away if you report that you shot a banded. We are collecting that information so we know what the age ratio is and what the survival is. Um, and so anytime you report a banded bird, it's more information for us as we continue to ban these birds. So I'll put that information up in the chat box as well uh, so that you can go to that site if you need to. And with that, I'll take any questions. Yeah, there's a lot of questions, um, Catherine. And I think I wanna just hit them really quick so I can get onto the hunting part. Sure. Um, somebody asked, how to identify an African dove versus Eurasian in flight? And we, I think uh, when it comes to this question, it's, it's necessary because African dove or turtle dove have a season that coincides with the morning dove. Is right. that something that we should change or look at changing because of the fact that they are not native and we have this Eurasian dove that looks very similar to it? Is that right. something we should probably think about doing? Because me as a game warden, I wouldn't feel right uh, citing somebody who shot an African dove thinking it was a Eurasian during the open season for that. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm going to preface this by saying something that I hope doesn't scare off the hunters in this group. I personally do not hunt. So I rely upon the feedback of the hunters in telling me uh, what they see out there in terms of hunting. I imagine it would be very difficult to tell the two apart in flight. I, I think I would have trouble doing that as a birder. So I think it would be hard for the hunter as well. Yeah. Um, as far as that change, um, it's something I could bring up with my supervisor and discuss um, when we do a regulation package. Yeah. Um, so those things are on somewhat of a calendar system. Um, so when, and I'm not sure when we'll do the next one, but it's something I could um, bring up with them is, would this be something that the department would wanna consider because of that challenge, because yeah, I can see it being a challenge. It's a it's a visual challenge, and really, it's not going to affect what I think it was originally made because of the whole morning dove thing. But since this year Asian started, uh, it should be swallowed up with that. So, right. Um, good question. Um, uh, one of the other things, um, actually, I think I'll let you. Let me go ahead and get started with these other ones. Uh, my program. And some of them will be addressed live that way. So thank you for your presentation. And that was very informative. Sure. Right. Do you want me to go ahead and stop sharing so you can put yours up? Yeah, I already did it for you. All right, there we go. All right. So, all right. Well, thanks for those questions. I saw them coming in and they're really good. And hopefully I'll address some of them while we're covering this, this rest of this topic. This might be the meat and potatoes of what you're coming for is the whole hunting part, but knowing the biology of things and getting these little facts that Catherine presented are really good and need to know. Uh, you're going to be a really educated hunter and that's what we want. So what do you need to hunt your Asian doves? Well, in California, you need a current license and the upland game bird validation. Um, those are the two things you need. But while you're getting those, I would suggest you get your hip survey which is not required for the take of Eurasian dove, but it is required for the take of morning dove. So you might as well get it, it's free. Uh, just get it out of the way, get it put on your license, good to go. As far as methods of take, I saw this question earlier. Um, primarily it's gonna be shotgun, um, using non-lead ammo, a non-toxic shot. <clears throat> and I recommend you use sizes 
uh, four to seven. Myself, I use size six for everything I shoot, pheasants, ducks, doves, all those things. Uh, it just depends on the range in which you're shooting them. Sometimes I have had problems with uh, knocking down these Eurasian doves in the wintertime when they're a little bit heavier feathering and they're flying at a higher uh, range. So I would sometimes move, use a four, which makes it kind of expensive, but it's a great way to get your practice in um, when, you, when you're hunting. But like I said, there's a certain round box, you'll see it later that I like to use for everything I hunt and makes it really effective. So you can use a 12 or 20. I would recommend an improved cylinder or a modified choke um, when you're using those shotguns. With pellet rifles, uh, you can use a pellet rifle and it can have lead pellets or you can use non-toxic pellets. There's some options out there, um, but they can be used for Eurasian dove and they can be used for um, uh, rock pigeons, some rock dove, you know, which are, are domestic pigeons but you cannot use them for morning doves. So no morning doves can be taken with a pellet rifle, whether it has non-lead ammo in it or not. So it's not an authorized method of take for migratory game species. All right, some other equipment that you wanna think about taking are uh, motorized dove decoys. Um, there's other types of de uh, decoys. You have the clip-ons, uh, silhouettes, um, I'm gonna give some props to Colorado uh, uh, Wildlife and Parks. They, in their last magazine, they had these little, uh, a cutout thing. You can, basically it's a printout thing. You can print out the, the page. Uh, it's a mirror image, fold it in half, put some card stock in it. And it makes a really cool um, clip on decoy. You can use some binder clips, clip it on something. That card stock that you put in here will make it a really nice decoy. They not only have morning doves, it's a morning dove decoy, but they also have uh, Eurasian um, ones. And I'm going to include the link to this uh, in our links page that I'll send you after. Uh, these need to be blown up though. They're a little bit small. So if you know how to blow up your picture and print them off, maximize your page, you get a really nice decoy that you can get for free. Uh, basically, your computer ink and a little bit of arts and crafts, your kids might have fun doing it. Um, some other decoys that are good. I'm going to turn on my laser pointer here. Uh, are these uh, motion decoys that are called flickers, dove flickers. I actually bought some of these this week. Um, they go out in the field on the ground. When you see birds moving along the ground, you'll see them moving along feeding, they'll, there's a lot of motion out there and these little flickers mimic that motion. It's like a bird moving really quick, just jumping over and flight, a uh, short flight to the next spot to look for some seeds. That's what these uh, dove of flickers use. Um, so you have your silhouettes, you have regular clip-on decoys, uh, motorized decoys such as the mojo dove or robo dove, those work really well. Also, you want to make sure you have some comfort when you're out in the field. A nice stool, this is a swivel seat kind, works really well. Or you can just get the nice folding chair that you have uh, in, your, in your garage for sitting out front. Uh, you want to take a cooler for your game and your drinks. Usually this time of year, if you're hunting this time of year, it's fairly warm and you want to make sure you're very well hydrated. Also out in the fields, uh, mosquito spray, sunscreen, make sure you have those with you. I also want people to start realizing that safety glasses, <clears throat> if you have those with you in the morning when it's low light, switch to sunglasses, you know, once the sun's up, very important to protect your eyes. Most incidents of uh, people getting peppered or shot and having some eye damage is usually associated with dove hunting because they fly low. People are not aware of what they're doing. They're, they're gonna maybe, you know, not see what's beyond the target. Uh, make sure you wear those safety glasses when you're out there in the field and hearing protection if you want to protect your hearing. All right. When it comes to clothing, you'll want to layer up. You're going to want to wear drab clothing, something that will mix into the your environment fairly easy, nothing really loud. Um, the blaze orange isn't really used for dove hunting. Uh, you can use it when you're maybe going to or coming from the field. 
just to let people know that you're you're there and, and make them aware of you. But you want to mix in with the surroundings. And usually most dove habitats are in, so involved with seeds and thistle and just open ground. So your drab colors work really well. Uh, you want to try to you know, layer your clothes because in the morning it's very cool and then the afternoon it gets really hot. So uh, look for something that can offer you some sun protection, you know, a lightweight uh, long sleeve shirt or, or even some bug protection if it's possible. Also get a good hat. All right, here's one of my spots that I actually go out and shoot. Um, it is not baited, it's not a baited field, it's a dairy. This is a normal agricultural process and these Eurasian doves really love this place. Um, so most of you might tell me that you could get a bunch of doves, these doves in your backyard. Unfortunately, that's probably not legal, um, but Eurasian doves like to be near orchards and dairies. Uh, if you can't get permission for these exact places, you know, the dairy itself, uh, if they can give you permission to hunt somewhere on their exterior, uh, that would be great. But a lot of times, uh, I can hunt this, the grain, you know, stockyard for these doves, set up some um, decoys, and it makes for some really good shooting. And there's also a lot of pigeons that come into these two that the, the dairymen really despise. So if you tell them that you'll take some pigeons also, uh, you know, help save some of their feed, help save some of the mess from all the um, pigeon dung that's uh, clogging up all their gutters, they would probably you know, they'd almost pay you to come out there and do it. So get out there and look, scout, look and see what dairies are maybe close to metropolitan areas because all these birds that are living in town, they wanna get this grain and they're gonna visit these areas. So the closest, uh, most, you know, uh, well-managed dairy can probably be the best place to go out and shoot some Eurasian uh, doves. But above all else, make sure you clean up before you leave. Don't ruin the opportunity for somebody else to, uh, to hunt out there. Don't give us a bad name of being a pig out there and, and just leaving shells all over the place, uh, leaving trash. Don't clean your birds right there in the yard with feathers all over the place. Try to make it look cleaner than what you arrived, um, what it was like when you arrived there. If you can't get exactly onto a dairy or into a, a um, orchard where these birds are roosting, try to find some place in between where they're making this migration route. Now, I'm not, it's not really migration, it's just movement from one thing to the other. So look into those things. Uh, next page. I'm not watching the chats or the questions, so I'll make sure that those get addressed later. Um, keys to identification uh, for, for this is your time to pay attention, okay? Luckily, Eurasian um, doves, there's nothing wrong with uh, taking one, you know, in season or out of season with, a, there's no season, but out of season of a morning dove, if you take a Eurasian, you're fine. If you take a Eurasian during the morning dove season, you're fine. There's no limit, uh, no season. But when I'm trying to identify them, I'm usually looking at the tail of the dove. It's very blocky. And this picture right here is a little bit actually too much, uh, showing too much fanning out. Usually this morning dove is, has a really wispy tail, a very pin tail. It's usually held together when they're in flight. Uh, they look like they have just this uh, pointer, the stinger hanging out the back of them. It's very narrow and very, very wispy compared to the Eurasian dove. Now that was a good question about the turtleneck dove. How can you tell them? I don't think you're gonna be able to tell them in flight. Um, hopefully you can get a regulation change regarding that. Catherine maybe can push something because it just makes sense, all right? So uh, I agree with that. If somebody wants to push it, you can go to your Fish and Game Commission and suggest that change. Uh, all those different things can happen. But the biggest thing is always be sure of your target and before you pull a trigger. Uh, if you already have a limit of morning doves and you wanna stay and shoot your Asian doves, well, then you better know your species because uh, you don't wanna have an accident. So uh, don't put yourself in that predicament. Uh, also, when you're out there in the field, the best thing to do to learn how to, 
to distinguish these is watch them. When you know what it is, watch them fly away, get to know their habit, how their uh, wing beat is, the, their, their flock pattern. All those things are distinguishing characteristics that can help you from um, making a mistake. All right, a couple more slides. So let's say you get some doves, okay? What are you gonna do with them now? What do you do? Well, set yourself up a nice little cleaning station. You can get some rubber gloves. I like these snips. I buy these from Home Depot. I use them for everything when it comes to um, cleaning ducks or cleaning any type of bird. Uh, regular poultry shears to me just don't last long enough. They're more expensive, but you can go to any hardware store. I didn't mean to say just Home Depot, but any Lowe's, Home Depot, Ace, whatever it is. They have these snips that are made for cutting wire or heavier material. Uh, these are actually serrated. I like the serrated snips better because they help catch the bone when you're trying to cut through something. And they cost about 18 bucks, not the 45 or 75 that these fancy uh, game shears cost. So get some game shears, a bowl for your finished product. Uh, when you're plucking the bird, if you're out in the field, you have to leave a fully feathered wing or head attached, okay? So you can't completely clean this bird out in the field. So if you're gonna pluck it, it doesn't take very long. Actually, I've got a bird here. I was gonna play a little joke and uh, tell you how easy it was. Um, here's the bird. Uh, as you can see, it's just basically, um, the feathers really wanna come off it. It's just a matter of pulling with your thumb and index finger and pulling up and you get a full gob of feathers. The whole breast is almost exposed just with this one pull. It comes very easily, um, not hard to clean. I think it takes about three minutes to pluck a bird. So not too bad. Um, I like to pluck out on the wing to the first joint, right past the drummy, okay? Um, and then all the way down the, down the, uh, the feet to the you know, ankles or whatever you wanna call that. And then get your snips and the snips should just cut down to the joints, cut on the joint there. Uh, so for the wings and the, and the feet, cut, cut right at the joints. You don't wanna have sharp bones. If you're gonna put it in the bag, the sharp bones will cause your bag to get a hole in and you have leaky marinade or blood in your bag. Uh, I like to cut at the joints. Um, as far as taking the entrails out, I like to cut right above the vent between the vent and there's some little hip pointer bones there, makes a good spot to open up the bird. And then you cut down the back, okay? When you cut down the back of the bird, makes it easy to uh, get those entrails out because what happens usually is the lungs stick along the back. Um, this makes for a real easy way to open up the bird and get all the entrails out. Some people like to save the heart and the gizzard, uh, that's fine. Uh, know how to prep those. The gizzards will have to be opened up and have all the grit and seed removed. And the hearts are, are a nice little snack too. You can put those all in skewers and have those for any type of meal. Okay, next slide. So once you get the product uh, finished, you got the head cut off, you're at home, you know, you've transported them, you can cut the heads off or the wings off. Uh, you'll want to finish with the wash, make sure you get all the feathers off. This is what you'll end up with. Uh, I do a continued split with those shears, end up with two halves, and you can put your fam you know, whatever your favorite flavor of rub is on there. Montreal steak seasoning. I like Pappy's prime rib rub. It's one of my favorites for ducks and doves, uh, regular Pappy's, whatever it is. But uh, give them a good seasoning inside and out, uh, you know, on the inside rib cage area, outside. Uh, and let them sit for a day in your fridge. Get them a nice little dry rub seasoning and then go out and on a hot grill the next day. Put them on three to five minutes on both sides and you'll want to leave them a little bit pink. If you see this here, this is basically a nice little chunk of uh, breast meat I cut out of here that you know you can tell it doesn't have that gray or brown look to it. Because if you cook it too long, it's honestly going to taste a little bit like liver. And I don't like liver. I know there's people out there who do, but uh, it's not my favorite thing. So don't overcook your meat. I have been eating wild game for almost 50 years. Um, and it's been not, not that long. Uh, let's say 40. 
uh, and it's uh, I've never been sick from it. So uh, I've cooked this the same way all the time, and that's the way I like it. All right, and the last slide. So any questions that I didn't answer, we can go ahead and offer to answer them now. The other thing you'll want to do is uh, August 4th is my next webinar. You can use that QR code right there to, uh, to get them to that registration site. Uh, go out and have some fun. We're going to talk about California dove hunting. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about applying for dove hunts. Hopefully you've done that. You still have some time till August 11th to do that if you haven't. Uh, go and watch the webinar if you haven't done that. But we're going to go ahead and uh, make sure all the questions were answered. So Catherine, if you want to come up and we'll go ahead and uh, answer these. I think we have time. All right. And then Robert, if you had anything that uh, came in the chat, I don't have the chat open. Um, we'll, we'll answer stuff there. So the first one here, um, Kat, Catherine is what explains population of the Monterey Peninsula uh, less dense than the surrounding areas, including Big Sur. Anything on that? Yeah, I'm here. I'm trying to figure out how I accidentally minimized everything on my computer. Um, yeah, so I think the short answer to that is I think they're looking at the 2009 abundance index map. And I think there's a couple of things to consider. I think that you need to remember that's just one year of data. So in a given year, maybe somebody went out and ran it on a day that the Eurasian collar doves were just all on their nest and weren't as cooperative because it is done during the breeding season. Um, so that's another reason why we do those five-year rolling averages is to sort of get a better estimate of what it ought to be typically rather than just in one year where they may not have um, been as easy to detect. Okay. Um, but the other thing too, uh, there's a number of different factors that I can think of in my head from, um, you know, I don't know, and I don't think anybody does, how many different areas have um, TNR colonies for feral cats or things like that, that might have more of an impact on the population. Um, that would be one thought, predators in the landscape. There's a okay. couple of different things I can think of. And TNR, if you're familiar, that's trap, neuter, and release program right. for uh, feral cats that some people believe works. I've seen that done at Sea Ranch up in the um, Sonoma County. Um, actually, it, it kind of seemed to work. I, I saw less and less cats as uh, my time there went on. Um, <clears throat> are those collection dates May and June when the hot spots are hottest? So I guess maybe the routes. Um, is that like the best place to be at that time? Or are you just looking for natural dispersion? I don't, I don't know how that was asked. Yeah, I think, I think what they're asking really is, do we deliberately do the survey during that time frame um, because we're more likely to detect birds? And the answer is more or less yes. Um, it is a breeding survey. so. We're doing it at a time window when we know that more birds are going to be defending nests, defending territories, being vocal, um, trying to attract females. So there are a number of different things that were taken into account when they developed this route system that said, okay, they're going to be detectable at this time and we could track um, the population by just assuming, you know, if you have fewer birds in a population, that's fewer birds being detectable. Uh, when you do the survey. Um, an important thing that I would like to make um, clear is that uh, we are to run those routes at the same time every year. So even though we know that global warming is occurring, we know that populations have changed where they've ranged because of global warming, we haven't skewed when we do the count. We do the count at the same time every year, regardless of that. Okay. Um, one question that came in is, uh, <clears throat> Do they eat larger seeds because they are larger birds or differences in anatomy? You were mentioning about uh, them being able to eat larger seeds. Honestly, I have found doves with half segments or full almonds in their crop. Um, so I don't really agree with 
you know, that, I don't know, people said I was crazy, but I've taken apart dove, dove crops and you find big segments or, uh, you know, big uh, almond seeds in there and uh, have not seen them have any problems digesting them whatsoever. Yeah, right. And I think the digestion, what you're alluding to at least, um, one thing to consider there is too is, again, going back to grit, you know, if a bird has taken in a fair amount of grit, then they're probably not that worried about being able to break apart larger particles. To answer the person's question quickly, um, a bird that is larger would have a larger bill and thereby would be able to take larger seeds, potentially. Um, during the dove trapping, the morning dove trapping, I've watched morning dove at a trap gobbling food as fast as they could in the panic before I came to take them out of the trap. So um, they panic and sometimes they'll eat things very, very quickly and it might be bigger than what they should eat. They're dove, they don't always think that through. Um, so I think it's variable, but I think the short answer is a larger bird means a larger bill, typically. Okay. And does cooking kill Newcastle's disease? I didn't think we said there was anything uh, to worry about from bird to human transmission on that, but uh, what, what so, do you say? So I saw that question and I kind of went down a rabbit hole and was trying to get a straight answer myself to be able to help answer that. Um, the only thing that I really found is that um, there's some suggestion out there that if you approach it the way you would salmonella and you just make sure your meat is cooked thoroughly, one thing I found said 165 degrees. So if you have a meat thermometer, stick it in the meat and just make sure it's gotten up as high as 165 degrees. But I would certainly encourage you to do a little bit more research on that yourself and um, look and see what the standards might be for salmonella because they're probably pretty similar. Okay. Uh, one other thing that um, was mentioned, somebody was looking for the best time to hunt and where. So that is variable. Um, out, just get out into the field. That's the first thing to do. And try to see if you can recognize habits of the birds. Uh, like I said, I go out to this dairy that's close to my hometown. And um, some, sometimes of the year, it's early morning. There'll be an early morning flight. And other times it'll be 11 o'clock in the uh, morning. And other times it'll be one o'clock in the afternoon. So uh, they tend to vary their schedule, but they, they won't change it like drastically from one day to the next. But seasonally, uh, it probably changes. So um, keep a, I, I should start keeping a, a log of what time was best for that time of the year or that day so that I don't have to guess every time that I do want to go out. But um, that would be a good idea is to chronicle your hunts and see what the weather was like, what the temperature was like uh, for that date. Just put it in a little you know, calendar book if you can and give yourself a good history of when and where they were doing these certain things. And usually seasonally, they'll go back and they'll repeat those. So. Uh, birds are very habitual uh, when it comes to waterfowl or dove. Uh, they kind of know where they're going and what they want to do just based on their, you know, previous year's experience. So that's what I would give you as advice. Anything else? One more question. Uh, do they have a daily routine? Wake up, eat, drink, and nest again? I would say yes. Um, uh, like I said, uh, it varies with the season on um, when they might go out to the field versus, you know, staying around roosting. Uh, but, but the, yeah, it's very, it's very routine. And um, when you figure out that routine, it, it will, it'll save you some time as a hunter. So instead of getting out there at one o'clock, which might be three hours too early for the flight, uh, if you put the routine down on paper and you know it, um, it could, it could help you not waste that time, but it comes with getting out in the field and scouting and paying attention when you're out there at any opportunity or using friends. Hey, have you seen anything going on? You know, what time of day was it? Uh, can you kind of keep track of that for me? You know, use some of your outputs out there that are out there and, you know, good hunters will keep track of that. Same thing happens with deer, um, bears, any of those pigs, they have certain routines 
And if you can have somebody help you figure out what those routines are, you'll be more successful. Anything else? All right. Well, we did uh, proceed to go till 7.20. I put this till 7.30 and most of you are still here. I appreciate that. I lost a few. Um, thanks for coming. This will be recorded. If you um, missed any part of it or you want to share it with any friends you, or revisit it, it should be hopefully be out early next week. We have to get it closed caption certified and then we'll get it out to everyone. So thank you for coming. Sign up for that next webinar. I'd really love to see you there. I'd like to see a high attendance and bring your questions. And as always, reach out to Catherine. She's available, myself, our whole 100 education program. We're here to answer questions and help you become uh, better, safer hunters. Uh, so thanks for joining us and good night.